Hey everyone, welcome back to the Keys to Home Buying podcast. I'm Justin Mead, and this week I'm going to be talking about home appreciation and equity, kind of how all that all works and why everyone's so gung ho about it, especially the equity aspect. I was talking to my wife a while ago, and she even didn't quite understand how equity worked. Now she does, and it's really pretty magical when you when you look at it at the end of the day, especially when comparing renting to home ownership. So before we get into that, last week we did have Connor Johnson on the show. It was amazing having him on as an interviewee. I do plan on having more people on the show. And if you want to see somebody in particular, or if you're in the industry and you want to be interviewed, reach out to me at jmead at homebridge.com. We'd love to have you and want to hear feedback from anyone listening on what other content you want to hear on this show. Again, the whole goal is to empower you and educate you as a home buyer to make your experience better when you are ready for that next step, wherever you may be in the process. So we'll start with home appreciation because I think this one confuses some people as they look at like what's happening in today's market. So right now it's February 1st, 2023. This year versus last year, we're actually starting to see some price reductions, which people look at that and they say, ooh, homes are losing value, which would be depreciation, right? So out the gates, depreciation is something losing value. Appreciation is something gaining value. On average, pre-pandemic, the annual appreciation rates were somewhere between three and 5%. Now, if you look at specific years, obviously there was some depreciation, it's pretty rare. But when you go back to 2008, after the market crash, there was a, a significant amount of depreciation. That was a bit of a unique situation. Maybe we'll have another episode where we talk about the crash and what happened, why it happened, and why things are the way they are now with all the rules and uh, paperwork that we need to get you financing, which ultimately is a really good thing. Uh, but in general, depreciation is, is pretty rare and it's pretty low. So you only might see a, a couple percent in a year depreciation and then it comes back the following year so people are starting to see price reductions and confusing it with home depreciation we mentioned this in the interview with connor and the national media is kind of targeting that and you know the sky is falling is the message and uh no fault of their own it is what it is it's it's the truth there is price reduction and in some pockets of the country you are seeing depreciation but in general Home values are still appreciating. And the way it happens is it's as simple as supply and demand, right? If there is more inventory than there are home buyers, that's when you see depreciation. That's what happened in 2008. We had the market crash. Right now, we have the exact opposite. There is not enough inventory and way too much demand. There are a ton of home buyers out there, but not enough houses for them to buy. So that's going to cause prices to go up. Right. So think of it this way. If if you are just a regular person, which I assume you are, and you need to go out and buy some corn, you go to the farmer's market and you see that you've got 10 people in line also looking for corn. But that farmer only has two ears of corn for 10 of you. OK, well, sure, he might just sell it to the first two, but he also might say, look, I'm not going to have a lot of corn for a long time. I need to be able to grow it. I need to, to earn. So who's going to pay more? right? Between the 10 of you, you guys figure out what you're going to pay, what this corn is worth. So eventually two people are going to outbid the other ones and that's going to drive the price up and up and up. And now that corn is worth more. So the farmer takes that and goes back and, and grows more crops. Eventually he's going to have too much corn. And that's when there's maybe 10 of you, but he has 20 ears of corn and each of you only need one. So now he's got 10 extra and he's trying to offload them because they're going to go bad. So that's when depreciation comes into play. And he says, okay, hey, I'm going to offer these a half off because I need to offload these. Otherwise, they're just going to go to waste. So that's the simple supply and demand formula of where appreciation and depreciation come into play with a really odd food analogy, but it kind of works the same way in the housing market, right? So price reductions right now really are just an indication that sellers are still in the mindset of last year where they're going to get 10 to 20% over asking uh, with 30 offers on the table. That's just not happening anymore. And to be honest, demand has softened a little bit. So going into the end of last year, rates were increasing pretty rapidly. Home prices were still going up and it was entering the holidays. So demand dropped a little bit. Even though inventory is still low, that did cause some people to have to start, okay, 
we're gonna have to start offering concessions as a seller. Maybe I will have to reduce my price back to a more normal amount. But at the end of the day, if you look at what that new amount that it got sold at versus what it was worth the year before, the home still went up in value. So appreciation is still there. Um, we look at two reports for appreciation. Case Schiller and FHFA come out with one every month. They provide year over year and month over month numbers. So Case Schiller came out 7.7% year over year. Now this is going back to November closings. So it is a bit of a delayed report, right? We're in February now. This report came out uh, yesterday, so the end of January. And uh, what would that be? November, two month lag on when this data is available. So back in November, it was exactly like I just talked about. Demand softened a little bit. Prices started to kind of regulate back to what they should be. So, but in general, year over year appreciation was still up 7.7%. But if you look at the month over month, and if you factor in seasonality, right? So winter time, the demand is lower to begin with. Factoring that in month over month, it was down 0.3%. So technically, month over month, you maybe saw some depreciation, quote unquote, but <clears throat> year over year, still up 7.7%, which is still a very high number. So what that what that means is the 7.7% is if your home was worth 100,000 November of 2021, November of 2022 is worth 107,700, right? You gained 7.7% of the home's value over a year's worth of time. So that kind of leads into the equity conversation, right? Because appreciation is directly correlated to equity, to figuring out what your equity is. So to define equity, that is your ownership of the home. So if it was a $100,000 home and you paid cash, your equity is $100,000. You own 100% of it, it's worth 100,000, you have $100,000 in home equity. If a year goes by, it's now worth 107,700, you gain 7,700 in equity. So if you look at it from a return on your investment standpoint, there's a lot of argument to be said that you get a higher return if you put less down, right? So if you put 3% down, 3,000, and you gain 7,700, well, that's, you know, you gained double what you invested, over double what you invested, versus if you paid all cash and your investment's 100,000, you only gain 7.7%, just the appreciation amount. So equity is what you own of it. Now, it grows over time as long as appreciation goes up and you make on-time payments. So if you bought it last year with financing and you made normal principal and interest payments, the way those payments work is a portion goes to the principal balance and a portion goes to interest. If any of you have ever had student loans, you know the magic of compound interest where most of it goes to interest at the beginning and towards the end of the loan term, most of it goes towards principal and it just kind of scales over time making that shift. So about halfway through is when you're making half principal payment, half interest payment. So that's why you know your parents might tell you, hey, make extra payments towards your principal as much as possible so that you pay less interest. Because obviously the sooner you pay it off, the less interest you have to pay. So if you bought it last year and you pay, paid down the principal, say, $5,000 and you gained $7,700 in appreciation, well, now your equity is $12,700. You take the 5,000 of principal that you paid down and you add in the 7,700 appreciation gain. So now we can start factoring in if you go to sell that house, maybe there's a bidding war, right? So if, if we wait until the springtime, because a lot of the buyers I'm talking to right now, they're going to wait until rates come back down and there's more inventory available. Honestly, they may, be shooting those, they may be shooting themselves in the foot because that's just when everyone else is going to be coming back on the market as well. So they're just creating more competition for themselves, which is going to, again, drive prices up. Whereas if you buy today, obviously there's still some competition and there's low inventory, but there's less of a chance of a bidding war because most people are waiting. So today you might be up against two other offers. Maybe the price goes up a little bit. So say you were going after that house that's now worth 107 seven, maybe it goes for 110, right? So that seller just gained another 2,300 in equity just by the bidding war. But if you wait until the summer, hey, it's going to appreciate a little bit more. So maybe it'll be worth 109,000 by the summer. And B, that bidding war, you could be going up against five or six other offers instead of just two. And now the price is 115. So now the seller gains an extra 5,000 over what they would have if they just sold right now. 
Now, there's no exact science to that, right? I'm just spitballing and throwing numbers around. Who knows how many offers you're actually going to go up against? It really depends on the home and the demand in that specific home and general demand for housing at the time. Uh, but as we know, and as I said earlier, right now, demand is still high, even though it's softened a little bit with rates and prices still being high. It's still there. Comparatively to inventory, demand is still much higher. So to bring it back full circle, appreciation is how much the home gains in value over time. Equity is how much of the home you own versus the bank, or if the bank's not involved and you paid cash, it's how much you own of the property. If we want to take the equity conversation a step further, and we won't get too deep into this, maybe in a whole, another episode, I'll talk about these, but home equity lines of credit and home equity loans. This is where you can tap into that equity without refinancing or selling the house. You can open what's called a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, right? Or a home equity loan. There's small, subtle differences between the two, but more or less they're the same. Basically what that is, is a second mortgage on the property. All right. Now, obviously if you paid cash, it's just one mortgage, but if you paid with financing and you got a mortgage, now you have one mortgage for a certain percent of the home's worth, the home equity line taps into the remainder of what you actually own. So let's give you an example. Say it's the hundred thousand dollar home and you put 20% down, you own 20% of it right out at the gates. A year goes by, you've paid down 5,000 and it gains 7,700. So you have, if you take the 20%, you've had 20,000 of equity right up, right up front because of the down payment, you gain 5,000 and then the 7,700. So you're at 32,700 in equity. With a home equity line of credit, there are rules on how much you can borrow. Let's say you wanna tap into that and you wanna get back 10 grand. Well, you open a line of credit on the home, which essentially acts as a credit card that's backed by the equity that you own in your home. It's pretty cool. So you open the line of credit and then you can use it as you see fit. Now, again, there are different products out there for these HELOCs. Some of them require you to, to draw the full amount up front. Uh, some of them, it'll just open it and you can make draws as you see fit. And when I say draw, what I'm talking about is actually using the line of credit to get some money, right? So if you open a line of credit for 10,000, you can borrow up to 10,000 from the value in your home and you pay it down over time. You can borrow 5,000, you can borrow 3,000, you can borrow seven, up to whatever that line of credit limit is. So equity is super powerful in that sense as well, because you can actually tap into it and use it for whatever, whatever, um, whatever other <laughs> investments that you may want to pursue in the future. Say your kid goes to college and you have 50,000 in equity and you want to help them buy supplies for school and, and they now have a, a house they want to rent and you want to furnish it or whatever. You can get a home equity line to help with that. And maybe you want to help with some of their tuition. A home equity line could offer better rates than a student loan. So you have that that you can tap into and then just pay it off on your own time. So equity is incredibly powerful. It's your own money. It grows over time. It's kind of like a savings account, right? So if you're renting, you're paying your landlord's mortgage and building their equity. When you buy a house, you're pretty much opening a savings account that is your home. Now, the only time that this doesn't work is it like the 2008 crisis where home prices dropped significantly and people were underwater on their home is what it's called, where it's worth less than what they still owe on it. So in that sense, you bought it for 100,000, you put 20,000 down, and then the market crash happened and it's only worth 50,000, but you still owe 80. Well, that's a huge problem. You're underwater 30 grand. The only time that's really a problem is when you go to sell. So anyone that sold in that time was in a real bind and that happened a lot, it caused a lot of mayhem. If you held on to it over time, it did grow back and now they're in a good spot again. Uh, but you know, that's another thing to consider. National media might be talking about a bunch of homes that are underwater. Sure, maybe there are some, I don't think it's that many. And really, it's only going to be a problem if those homeowners go to sell right now. So kind of got off on a tangent there a little bit uh, away from what I initially wanted to talk about. But either way, that's a good kind of overall picture of appreciation and equity for anyone who was interested in kind of knowing what that meant as they go into home, buying a home. Kind of gives you another reason to, uh, to understand why homeownership is so powerful and so uh, good towards wealth creation, right? If you look at 
the top earners in our country, most of their wealth is from real estate, right? There's no coincidence there. It's just an incredible investment. So that's all I had for you today. Again, I would love to hear feedback if anyone has other topics they want to hear about, or if you are in the industry and you want to be interviewed, I would love to have you on the show. Email me at jmead at homebridge.com. I hope everyone has a great day and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning in.